Let me tell you, I think Trump is our homo stupidest right through us. When I curse, for example, I will curse in Serbian language. It just sounds so much dirtier. <laughs> <laughs> You miss the Dan Pepper conversation. You miss the Chris Eukins conversation. So a lot of interesting stuff happened there, especially okay, so in you Eukins. You want to talk about that? Well, if, if, I, I would have thought so. And then we have yeah. the conversation with Delia coming up. Um, yeah. I think that's a really important conversation. It'd be great, I think, if you could take the lead on that. It's like all of these hidden things in society that was bringing up some of the, the damage and issues we have in our society. Um, this COVID thing has, has highlighted the For fact sure. so many people can, are not safe in their own home. That's right. So they stay at, stay at home, not safe in their own home. Yeah. And what um, about kids, you know, that would get fed at school? You know what yes. I mean? So now you're telling them stay home, you're going to have really hungry kids. Yeah. And I mean, it's just really tough, yeah. you know? And elder care, people who have caregivers coming in to, to take care of them, mm -hmm. not only are they put more at risk with the coming and going of the caregivers now, but some caregivers have to stop. Yeah, because you, you know? can't, public yeah. transportation, they, they were yeah. taking to get to and from, it's... it's Yeah, so... Yeah, it's really it's, tough, but you know, I think, you know, we are lucky in Trinidad, we have an, I have an aunt who is 102, and so there are caregivers coming in, we are lucky that we have someone, you know, who's really... Living with her. Yeah, living. committed. She's not living, but, but really committed, and, and we can, you know, yeah. see, make sure what she's doing on her end, there's a trust, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, she's taking her precautions on her end. Um... Yeah, it's tough, 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 but... Um... Wait to have the... No, 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 what was it? Before and now, sessions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you are late. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> I was just on talking to... Uh, well, we started talking about this session with Delia, how important it is, and Jessica was telling us about um, in raise Saint your Lucia. voice, Saint Lucia. I'll, yeah. I'll put a link because they're trying to raise funds, um, yeah, for, for for domestic violence victims here in Saint Lucia. Who, you know, this situation has just made things worse for people who are already in vulnerable situations. So yeah, it's 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 tough. It's tough mm -hmm. and. A lot of fundraising and telethons and things that get um, promoted, you know, of course, as, as it's justified, they should focus on the people on the front lines, the doctors, nurses, police officers, and the people who are, you know, helping to collect garbage and the people who are packing groceries and so on and are out there in, on, on the front lines. But there are lots of hidden vulnerable communities and they are suffering. Yeah, for sure. And that's why there's also the issue of um, historically, that, as you're saying, marginalized communities um, like the African-Americans in the U.S. And now we're seeing from the data what is coming wow. out. I, I saw an article yesterday from St. Louis um, that n every single person who's died from the disease is African-American. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm very interested in this conversation with Delia, um, who is a public health education expert, a doctoral researcher at the Columbia University, New York, and living in the belly of the beast, New York. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be interesting to get some insight from her on what's going on in New York right now, today. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, her take, I know she has pretty strong views on um, the disparities of the health impacts of COVID. And, uh, you know, hopefully you could figure out, you know, what policymakers should be thinking about um, and how, what her ideas are and how they might be responding. 
mm -hmm. um, to this, you, this kind of thing. Yeah, you know? uh, we, we've known about some of these things for a while. Huh? Yeah. Um, the, the treatment of African Americans within medical care, the fact that they wait longer to, to, to get access to a doctor, um, the, often their complaints or their feedback is not listened to, it's just brushed over, ignored, um, and we, you know, we had um, this man who, is, who was actually suing um, because of the death of his wife in childbirth. And, um, I remember that case. Yes. Um, she no, was, there was, there was absolutely was no reason to die. Very fit. Yes, um, good health. Everything was supposed to be fine, and then all of a sudden, went this. in to have the child, and yeah, and she was more, complaining, and they weren't taking her seriously. Yeah, more, more African American women die in childbirth. The maternity death rates are higher yeah. for them than for any other group in the United yeah. States. But so, also there's the underlying the, um, morbidities issue, the mm -hmm. underlying morbidities, the, you know, the hypertension, diabetes that's so prevalent. Yep, and, and the food deserts that, that, that have caused that to happen and the, red, like, the systemic redlining of, of, of those communities in urban, um, desolate, underserved, Commun um, 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 blocks that are, are segregated off um, and any time they try to move outside of that so if they if they move outside of those areas into the areas with the with the whole foods and the parks and the whatnot they have to suffer this constant policing you know um, that's what are what are you doing here you know in our area um, and and so it's it's it, it and that for, for generations and generations of it's been designed to keep them within these unhealthy designated areas where the only access they have to to food is from the convenience store selling a whole bunch of high fructose corn syrup, high sodium um, processed food, yeah, which impact their immune systems and all of that and. You know, I think about Anya living in Slovenia and there so many of these Scandinavian, I don't know if it's Slovenian, no, Slovenia is not Scandinavian, no. but Scandinavian communities and a community like Slovenia, I don't know, I think they're so homogenous. This is my outside view. Yeah. You're so homogenous that you don't really have this kind of issue or I don't know if poverty causes a kind of disparity no, and... i think it's a bit of a different um heterogeneous society yeah. so what happened for example in our cases we don't have people of color we don't if you see a person of color walking on the street i mean my dad even said like i'm not a racist but i'm gonna be looking at that person like what the hell are you doing here because oh. there's no such case here um not that we would have racism i think it's far from that um I'd say that we kind of have a very high level of understanding of how to deal with different races. Um, partially that actually comes from, you know, the separation of war from Yugoslavia. So we lived together, numerous nations were actually forced to live under one umbrella. Um, and what happened in 90s is that the separation war brought a lot of migrants. So even though Slovenia is not really having anything um, like a near it's not close to Scandinavia at all, right? There's a whole Europe being before you reach to the Scandinavia, but uh, we do have something in common and that is the migrants. Um, we got the first wave and then a lot of people went to Sweden. Yeah. So it's funny because when I curse, for example, I will curse in Serbian language, not in Slovenian, I will, I will use Serbian language. Um, and it's funny because if you actually express yourself in that language to a Swedish person, the Swedish will most definitely understand what you said. Wow. because they have so many migrants right and i only got to understand that when i was having um, roommates from sweden um, and they were explaining it to me how you know in their neighborhood it's pretty normal to have like one of the friends from serbia bosnia croatia even um, and they even go for vacations very often um to those ends and mm -hmm. you know, why so do you curse curse in, why do you oh sorry well, why do you curse in serbian yeah. you all don't because, curse in serbian yeah, I, we do have Sounds curses. better. No, wait, wait, let me hear this. They don't have, let me hear this. No, Slovenian curses are 
obsolete, I would say. I mean, nobody uses them because it's like the translation would be 300 of Harry Bears. <laughs> you know, it's not something that you usually say when you're angry. <laughs> Okay. Or, 300 of Harry Bears. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Oh my God. Or, Isn't that interesting? Um, Slovenia is post expletive. Yes, a post expletive society. society. We know when they're there in, in the Caribbean. I think you have to be living in a place where frustration, frustration is high. That's why it came from the is Serbians. A, is a thing. That's why it came from the Serbians, the, the, the migrants. Yes, the, the, suffering. The suffering. Oh my God. <laughs> no, but this is interesting. You need discontent to yeah, to, 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 be able, to, to want to, to develop the cursing why, and to have tell you, agility in your language with cursing. The Creole, the Creole cursing sounds so much more impactful than, than our Trini, even go. our Trini slang, because the Creole is so linked to that. What's the Creole cursing? Yeah. What's it salop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is salop? Salop. It's it's from it's derived from the French. It's like bastard. Okay. It's like a slut. It's like uh, it, 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 it's all those things in in, okay. in incorporated nasty. It's it's. Uh, but yeah, when you hear when you hear it, in, in, it just sounds so much dirtier and and. <laughs> <laughs> But yep. The Serbians the, the, are very back creative to, when it comes to, to, to Slovenia and you, you yeah. have marginalized communities in Slovenia? Um, I mean, there's, so because of the migrants, um, there's this new population that kind of formed. Um, we call them Chifuri. Um, and then um, these are pretty much the people that come from the southern areas and have not really assimilated to the point where they would call themselves Slovenians because they still want to show that they have roots somewhere else. Um, and we had a very good integration. Like a couple of years ago, there was a book. And then out of that book, a comedy show. And out of the comedy show, there was a film. So there was like a stages of how the artist actually expressed his story. Um, and the story was about this person being a Chupur, so coming from the migrant family, um, and how he was not very well assimilated and becoming a Slovenian. But at the same time, whenever he went to the South, whenever he visited his families, he did not felt like he belongs to them either. So he was like in a space where he did not belong anywhere. Um, and that's where the frustrations were caused. And, you know, you want to show your roots. And at the same time, you prevent others to kind of see you as belonging to them and being the same tribe, being part of the same tribe. So... I think that those people actually went through these types, this type of, um, it's almost like a simulation period. You have less and less of them. Um, and I also think that a lot of us uh, became aware of how um, these roots need to be nurtured and how we need to kind of respect different cultures. And with that humor, with that story in place, a lot of us were able to understand what people are actually going through and how we can help them overcome those obstacles. Uh, so I think that humor is actually playing a huge um, part in how we assimilate and how we actually um, operate with different cultures and with these heterogeneous. But I mean, Slovenia is so small, like we've always been under someone else's control. It's like Trinidad was previously in the UK. We ran through from and Rome Spain and, and France. Exactly right. So you also have quite a lot of cultures in your historic background. Yeah. And so do we. I mean, I say that I curse in Serbian, but if you go to the northern part of Slovenia, people will speak fluently German language and they will use a lot of German words in their day to day. Um, and do they curse in German? Memory. That's the question. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if I hear them say scythe instead of. <laughs> what did you just tell me? Shit. <laughs> speak in German. Stop cursing me. Stop cursing me. Uh, but those are pretty much just the words that you use on a daily basis. Like if you, yeah, the curses are pretty bad. The Serbians are very creative when it comes to how to curse somebody's mother or, or the whole family. 300 hairy bears take cake. 
<laughs> Nobody uses that. Like we, we I am going to start using it. Politics. I'm going to start using it. Let me hear the context. Somebody does something to upset you. You go, you will lose 300 hairy bears or 300 hairy bears <laughs> coming on you. Oh, what is it? No, 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 no. That's actually just used when something bad happens to you and you're like, oh shoot, that really happened. Right. So instead oh. of the word shit, you oh, would be using 300 I hairy bears. Yeah. yeah. 300 yeah. hairy bears. Mm -hmm. But and if you want to curse someone, you usually go with, I mean, you never go with that. That's the old Slovenian people. Um, yeah, but I they would say, the devil is going to take you. I don't even know why we're speaking about that. Let's focus on something. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens. No, no, but this is... I'm learning. I think it's because we, we're venting about the frustration other people have. So I guess putting ourselves in probably the language they're probably using a lot right now. Yeah. <laughs> so the language is really an important aspect of our lives. Yeah. I mean, it allows us to kind of express ourselves and it allows us to connect each other and yeah. to all the historical roots that we have. Yeah. I mean, the language that you speak, if you look into it and how it developed, you can find a lot about the culture itself. Yeah, for sure. Like Trinidadian slang. It's English, <laughs> but it actually, it's not English. <laughs> I saw somebody, by the way, guys, I saw somebody online on Facebook using this bobbly of the day thing. Somebody uh -huh. just started it and they, they said Larry Lala. He was a former minister. It is Larry government. Lala? They call him the bubbly of the day for something he did with KFC and something else. So you see, people are thinking about this yeah. COVID yet. Yeah, almost COVID yet. Us. But who is our mm -hmm. homo stupid? We have so many candidates, Margaret, this, this, this week for our homo stupid us. Oh my God. I, I, it's almost like we were running out. Oh my God. No, have you seen the guy that actually had the, so there's a priest and he was streaming his mass over Facebook Live but he did not know that he had filters on. So he was praying and there were filters on his face all the time. What, which one, the Aww. doggy one? All, the, all of them. Aww. You need to share. Aww, that's not almost stupid. That's almost that's just, it's, it's an untouchably funny, but yeah. yeah. But, but I think we shouldn't be making differentiation between them. Like it should all be okay. connected to whatever happens, whatever funny happens within the COVID-19 era. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but, but this is, this is for people who should know better. I could understand the people of a certain generation. They're really trying to get a hold of this new technology now. And I know, I, I, you know, I have to, we have to applaud them for attempting and trying, mm -hmm. you know, at least making an effort. Um, even though there might be some comedic things about it, but it's like the people who <laughs> should know better, the people who have power and they have access, they have privilege, and they are endangering the lives of other people. Or they're only thinking about yeah. their power and their profit and nobody else. It's and like to be honest with you, when it comes to how we are having fun, I wouldn't be limiting ourselves to just the stupid people. Those are actually partially there are making me mad. Like from deep down in me, there's like rage going to those people. Like, what is wrong with you? You really are stupid. But there is like a whole bunch of just funny memes. Yeah. And I wouldn't be limiting our, ourselves just to the stupid one. <laughs> it's, I have it's, one. But I have it's one. Really I have Trump. one. It's really, yeah. I have one and it's Trump. Okay. And what he said about the, how he's trying to push this drug, guys. I can't pronounce yeah. the drug. You know um, the name of the hydroxychloroquine. Yes, hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine yeah. Or something like that. And pushing this drug that has not, there's not been a lot of research done on this drug. Um, and he has some connection there. I mean, it's crazy, yeah, right? You have a financial interest in it. Yeah, and saying, what do you have to lose? Just take it. I mean, my God. Hmm. And having, you know, Fauci having to come and say, um, come on, let's express, let's use some caution here. 
Well, he didn't even let him finish her. Because a, a reporter had asked him, um, Dr. Fauci, about the, the drug and he was about to answer. And then Trump just interjected and said, wait, wait, wait. No, and just cut it yeah, off. It's just crazy. I just think this misinformation from uh, at the leadership level, at the highest levels, when people are very concerned, people are very fearful, people don't know what to do, people are looking to their leaders for guidance because you, they have access to all of this information. So every day at these press conferences, we're looking for guidance. And for Trump to go there and to do this and to use that platform for his own personal interest, I mean, yes, we know Trump, but oh my God, right now, really, you're, we really have to continue with that? And then with his nephew, oh, no, no, son-in-law, um, being all a part of this effort and, and the relationships and the commercial linkages. And I mean, it's just too much. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Um, explain my, to he's me. My what actually happened, I, he's my homo stupidest. Trump. This I, I, I kind of love point to his son-in-law in charge of, of, of the emergency response. And apparently, you know, the government buys a federal stockpile of emergency supplies that states are supposed to have access to. The taxpayers have paid for this. This, this is um, materials bought with taxpayer money. Yeah. And what is happening is they are holding these stockpiles ransom and only giving it to states where the governors and whatnot are doing their Bidding. you know their, their butt kissing yeah, yeah. to to the to the, well, to the administration. okay i'm gonna be very provocative but these people voted him and they knew who who they voted he voted for trump yeah but they didn't vote for trump's son-in-law trump, did. son -in -law. And trump, did, trump didn't he get the he didn't get the um he didn't the get the popular votes. vote clinton did uh, hillary did but but yeah so you're not? right you're right but at the end of i mean the day, that's the democratic process and I know that it sucks. I'm not apologizing or anything. I, I'm not even justifying it at all. I think it's crazy how the demo democracy turned out to be actually the tyranny at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, it just led, like the whole system led to creation of a dictatorship that Trump now base actually runs. I think it's bottom down wrong. It shouldn't exist the way it does. Um, that's not the representative will of the population that this president presents at all. I don't think it is. He's not running the country in the best interest of all the citizens. He's running the country in the best interest of cap capitalism. Yeah. And I think that that's why he was elected at the end of the day, because people are still like feeding themselves with the idea of capitalism and America great. That's like, I mean, it's wrong. It's yeah. wrong from the early beginning. And it's going to be continuing to do shit and do wrong and never, it, it will never go in the interest of a person, like American citizen. Mm -hmm. It's quite horrible. I am very curious what Delia is going to tell us. I mean, she's going to have an insight to American health system and yeah, there is none. For sure. For sure. Like the way they're... Uh, Sometimes she defends it. I've heard her say that she thinks it's the best healthcare system in the world. And I think she's talking about, I know. The technology. I yeah, the technology that the, that the innovation has produced as opposed to access um, and affordability. Um, I think that's what she's referring mm -hmm. to. But I think even on that level, I think Cuba beats, beats, beats the US on that. And I think other countries might. So um, I'm hoping not to get into an argument with Delia. In, in this conversation um, because this is her area of expertise. So I, I really just want to learn and listen from her. But back on that Trump and Jared Kushner, his son-in-law's point, with the Chris Eukins conversation, Chris and I didn't really agree on a lot, but we yes. agreed on that. We agreed on we that. We agreed on, on Jared on, Kushner's role in the context yes. of stockpiling of these uh, supp emergency supplies and, you know, causing this sort of enmity between state and central um, government and federal government. I mean, crazy. I mean, and, 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 and Chris is basically pro-market oriented procurement, yeah? He's mm -hmm. pro that. Um, and even he was like, yeah, Jared Kushner, no, no, mm. not at okay. all. Okay. Yeah.
that yeah we need to talk about some of those conversations that the both of you have had uh, and some of the things that maybe you would like to pull out um and highlight as things that you you, you would like you, that future law institute could would, would 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 want to promote and latch on to um well, for definitely I, of, but we 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 are reflecting and developing our normative positions coming out of covid but one of the things um at the future law institute we are really trying to do is not to rush um, I think we're in a period right now where things are rapidly evolving and changing every day. And uh, uh, there are experts and expert organizations moving very quickly and rightly so with the resources to do so, moving very quickly uh, with responsive measures. Um, and I think at the Future Law Institute, because our work really is a long-term sort of trajectory, we are thinking about not the next one or two years, but the next hundred years and the development of the law in that space, uh, you know, 50 to 100 years, we are a little slow. What we are doing right now is we are now developing a project with some partners um, to develop the most comprehensive global government COVID-19 response database in one place, open source, um, where other database builders can come and integrate their sources, where experts from all over the world can come and see, and, and hopefully we can get a cadre of people um, uploading and monitoring with us. We already have a team of about 20 something lawyers from all over the world um, working with us. It's very early stages, um, but we're pretty excited about that. So our focus is not necessarily developing normative policy positions right now for now although i mean that's already started to come so for example from the conversation with chris Eukins, i mean um one of the things that really you know annie and i've been talking about after um is what he was talking about with respect to emergency procurement and what is happening in the eu what's happening in the us with respect to e the demands of emergency procurement and you know annie is a blockchain expert Yes. Um, and, you know, we had been, I would say, just bashing ideas around about blockchain and supply chain management and how we can use blockchain technology to create a platform that can bring greater transparency to emergency procurement, transparency so that people in real time could see where uh, PPE is being produced, where it, it can be shipped, quality controls on it. I mean, I, I have no idea how it would really, um, from a technical perspective, work. But yeah, that definitely, our minds after that conversation have been thinking about that. And then, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, his, I, I could understand what he was saying with making the market as open, and competitively conducive as possible yeah. would help the end user but only if the end user has some like you said access and, and and there's transparency and the end user has some means of giving feedback or yeah. you know they, they're a stakeholder in it too um if they're just completely outside of it have no idea what's going on what's being yeah. purchased behalf what not how, well he how, did to be fair he did say there must be quality controls and his focus was on the quality right but i the part i didn't like because I, I mean i agreed we need to have a focus on the quality and what the what the customer what the end user gets at the end of the day absolutely we don't want bad drugs going to people we don't want poor quality ppe and people dying okay but at the same time we don't want a situation where suppliers feel that they can price gouge and they can raise the price to whatever and they can shop for the best bidder, right? That is crazy, you know, they're bid shopping. So you have a situation where a government has negotiated to get a particular supply of goods. And then last minute you're hearing, I don't know if Anya was giving me that example. I think Anya was referring to some example like that, where at the last minute the supplier or maybe it was chris the last minute the supplier said no they're gonna give it to another government who paid more i mean yes that's open market but there's something about that that 
to me, open, we cannot allow open market to regulate distribution of critical PPE and supplies and infrastructure yes. right now. There, there needs has to, to be, be some a, balance. a price cap yeah. and the competition, you know, it would be great if competition is not about price. It is about quality, quality and, and driving innovation yeah. there. Absolutely. I want you all to compete on giving yeah. us the best yeah. quality And compete product. on building not, local I'm not capacity. Sure if we actually, I'm not sure if we very well understand how the price is uh, being raised, though. Because what I'm hearing is that, sure, there are suppliers that are providing, you know, they're collecting the beads right but at the same time what actually happened with the mask was that there was a, a huge order of more like millions of masks and because suppliers only have six factories the price went up but the price went up reasonably because they actually needed to collect more workers in a very short time they had to collect new material to actually create those masks from that raw material um, so altogether the raise of a price might actually be very reasonable or at least based on you know how the production actually happens not necessarily because they're looking for who gives more money to them um, yeah, and true. when it comes to who gives more money to them what we are actually looking for is not necessarily a limit like a cap limit because we don't know how the production works but more or less like a consensus among countries sure this country is going to take this many masks, this country is going to take this many masks, but let's make it proportional to what the needs of every specific country are. Because what I'm seeing is that, for example, countries are closing the borders because they're afraid that their citizens will need more of that medical equipment and they don't want that equipment to go past their borders to another country. Which means there's basically no solidarity whatsoever among the countries. While at the same time, we would actually, like I, thinking of myself as a global citizen i don't really care to which country i belong to what i care about is that those in need have the priority over the medical equipment before i do if i'm not the one actually um falling in the category that is prioritized right i shouldn't be relying on my country just making sure that we as the citizens of slovenia are provided with everything maybe we don't need that and that's, for example, what happened with the water supply. I mean, it's, again, a very provocative example. But what we've done is that we um, secured all the supplies, all the sources of the water in our country. And we made that on a constitutional level. So it's like the highest level of security that you can provide to an asset that a country has. Mm -hmm. I was kind of bothered. Because as much as I understand where these need come from, comes from, and it comes from, you know, um, Nesquik and all the Arab oligarchs are kind of buying those sources of waters from the countries that have a lot of water supply, right? And as soon as the private sector buys them, the country can no longer um, provide a security to its citizens that there's going to be always the access to the water supply. Sure, I get that. And I know where the fear comes from because we've seen those cases with Haiti and stuff like, oh, Fiji water and stuff like that, right? Yeah. We've seen that happening before. But at the same time, my country, while securing those sources of water, is never going to have the capacity to distribute that same water to whomever on earth might actually need those sources of water. Because what my country is only going to do in the next couple of years is to secure that water comes to its citizen. Yeah. Yes. They yeah, will so, never okay. invite Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in I think you've made a good point. I think you've mm -hmm. made a good point, going back to, you know, the PPE and all of that, about the need for global coordination of production and supply. Okay, yeah. that's what you're talking about. Um, that doesn't mean that price gouging does not also exist. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I take your point absolutely. Of course, prices will increase because the production demands increase and, and the producers will have to incur more costs. But we have heard, we have had stories and evidence of price gouging um, on the part of some suppliers. Not, I'm not saying all suppliers, but there has been reports about that. And so I, I just think we have to, to figure out a, a combination of responses that, 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 that could deal with, with, with yeah, yeah, the multiplicity of risk, I guess, arising in this situation. Um, 
but yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting time. What about this thing with Trump? Let me tell you, I think Trump is our homo stupidest right through. He's our homo okay. stupidest right through. This is another one. We do this have is another this. one. Yeah. Wait, I just want to see this because it came up in terms of global coordination of production and supply. You saw Rihanna bought <laughs> PPE for, or, or, or supplies for Barbados. And ventilators too. And ventilators. And Trump stopped it from leaving their borders. He did the same. Cayman Islands as well. What, and what about 3M? What, his 3M supplies with Canada. That, yep. you know, that's, a, nah, that's our homo stupidus, guys. Isn't that our homo stupidus? Okay, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, does Anya yeah. have a... Uh, and Anya? Well, I, 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 I could go with that. I was, going to, I was going to talk about that Louisiana pastor, but... Do tell us. Who is going, who are saying Christians should be willing to die? Oh, God. Um, and, and if you're a true Christian, then you shouldn't be fearing death. That's should, true. I saw that one in it. You, you're using people's... Real covid ...spirituality and faith and guilting them, guilting them into putting their lives at risk to prove how much of a, how spiritual they are. I mean, that is yes. so wrong. It is so manipulative too, you know? Wait, Jessica, there was another one that you posted, I think, was it on Facebook? But it wasn't from America. It was like a priest that said that um, the COVID-19 is going to kill all the gays. Oh, oh it was a rabbi in, in Israel. Was what was that? That was a punishment a for the, Oh, that Jesus. Is a, and, and then, then he, he got it himself. <laughs> yeah. I was like, the, the fact that this story years. actually... 300 hair repairs. Yeah, that, that was a really a good one. When, um, a piece of epistemological rigor, but I, I think just more so than anything else, but, but empathy. And, and that empathy includes empathy for understanding you are not the master of anybody else's spiritual, intellectual, whatever thing. And you have no right to demand that they need to do this or do that in order to prove their level of, of spirituality or anything like that. Um, this is a time when all of these issues are going to become so important right now. And Jessica, what is true? remember, you know what we, we are trying to create, and we were having this conversation for hours on, uh, yes. as we were trying to define and you solve, what is the mindset that we are trying to help people develop when we call it the empathic mindset, right? And remember, we were talking about this issue of, you know, you know in order for people to really develop empathy for a, a position that they do not hold, or to be open to the fact that the position that they hold is wrong, is that they must develop the, the critical thinking ability to ask and constantly question, what is the basis upon which I hold this view? And I think for Christians, right? Mm -hmm. Christians have been brainwashed and I'm coming from a place of having been one, right? Um, are brainwashed with the, there is a bullet point. Yeah, epistemological rigor. There is a bullet point on, uh, on that epistemological question. How do you know what you know? I read it in the Bible. Because the Bible... Um, the, uh, what is the song? For the, Bible. the Bible tells me so. What's it's, it's, it's the handing over of all, all effort to make any kind of critical thinking not just to a compilation of books, yeah. but to the trusting of the religious authorities' interpretation and application of yeah. um, this, their, 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 um, yeah, their, 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 and this how world, they try to feel it. I, yeah, go ahead, sorry. And as, as, the, as, the, as the Voltaire saying goes, absurdities lead to atrocities. Sometimes intentionally or unintentionally, you could intentionally or unintentionally hurt someone by acting from a place of falsehood. Um, and and of what? 
you you can intentionally or unintentionally hurt other people by acting from a from a, a basis of falsehood so if what you if what you're proposing is not actually true it's not true scientifically it's not true ethically it's not true and at all and you are going by that and you're basing actions and that it ends up hurting people like the and 5g like the 5g issue the 5g issue again um and, and my 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 stance on this is that i don't have enough information me too <laughs> i don't, I don't know. have so i don't I will, know i will distance <laughs> i uh, what i want to see is is rigorous debate and 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 that is how we figure these things out and how you know how you know where there is um reason to be cautious is when that debate is being shut down when yep. people are trying to n silence certain voices uh, not you know what not or corporations are paying money just to only have their experts and nobody else that is when your red flags should sort of go up yeah um so it's that that we we need to but getting back to that whole thing um we do need to address this. It's an uncomfortable subject. People say, you know, you shouldn't talk. But it is religion, politics, and what's the other one? Is it race? They, 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 they yeah, I know it. Politics. It's religion, politics. Politics. And um, I think it's maybe it's race. race. It's probably, yeah. yeah. Um, the, that, that these forbidden things, um, we shouldn't talk. And we are going to be diving headlong to some extent into that with, with Delia. In the and also, and also, yeah, let's, we have to run off, we have to get off this to go to Delia, but Delia actually is a, a, is a Christian and a very committed one. It might be interesting, and she's a scientist. And so, yes, it might be interesting. And, and I, I follow um, a, a few progressive Christians um, who they are very much into, we need to respect evidence. We need and she to is that. She is respect that. the human rights of other people, even if they do not adhere to our theological point of view. We must, our theological point of view actually says that we have to treat every single person yeah. the way we would like to be treated. And yeah. that de facto means respecting the human rights of other people who we might disagree with completely, that we might, you know, think in our you know, ideology are not following the right path, maybe, but we still have to respect their, and we cannot work against in law, trying to disenfranchise them, trying to deny them. So I, I mm -hmm. am very familiar with Christians who have that position. And because I am, you know, it's why I'm not, I, I, when I go after, I only go after the Christians who use religion and use the Bible as a weapon. Mm -hmm. against the human dignity and the mm -hmm. human rights of other people yeah. and, and and in their actions whether it is to their own children whether it is to other people you know this whole thing of franklin graham setting up getting government contracts to run charities to deal with this COVID response but you don't want to serve anyone who does not want to attend your religious services you don't want to serve anyone who is lgbt who is you know you are so you are taking taxpayer money that and and and, and setting up public services that are for the public but you don't want to serve the public you want to i think i think that these actually deserve it's like not behind the scenes they should be on the scene mm. yeah. what we're addressing right now let's have a conversation and let's put jessica on the front page <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes anya you, you, you do have no, experience no, no. I, I i can't wait for this with delia and let um, yeah, yeah but like yeah. we need to you quickly know, get our homo one. empathicus yeah after okay let's after. wrap it up we gone right past these three minutes see you okay. on the yeah. other time okay, okay. <laughs> bye guys bye. see you on the inside